So we'll be starting in a couple minutes here. So everybody grab your coffee or your water and get ready for a great advocacy day. Is that, um, is that feed streaming or starting? Yeah. Diane, how long will this last? About an hour and a half. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Diana? Yes. Are we live? Are we live? Yes, we are. Okay. We got about one minute left and we'll be starting. Great. So we still are missing Amy.
Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, it's a little after 10 o'clock and we are ha having our first virtual advocacy day. And we're really excited about this. I wanna welcome everybody. Um, remind everybody to please be respectful with your comments. Um, this is a difficult topic we're talking about with the proposed budget cuts, but we want to make sure that we keep our comments respectful. And so, Jessica, I am going to turn it over to you. Oh, we need to unmute you, hon. Okay, there you go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Renner and I live in the 33rd Legislative District. I am an advocate as well as the advocacy coordinator for self advocates in leadership. Sale, I will be your self advocate co host alongside the arc of washington state and the washington state developmental disabilities council for this virtual advocacy day six week series there are a few things you need to know before we get started first everyone will be muted at the beginning of the webinar second if you have questions you can type them in the q and a box or raise your hand using the icon Click on the raise hand icon to ask a question or to post a question. Type it in the Q&A box by clicking the Q&A icon located next to the chat icon in the middle of your toolbar. If you raise your hand, we will unmute you when we call your name. Then you can unmute yourself using the microphone icon on the bottom left side of your toolbar. This will allow you to ask your question. The raise hand icon is located on the bottom right corner under the more option third. If any of the participants today want to welcome the guests or talk to other attendees, please use the chat box for it. I would like to remind everyone that we are also live streaming these virtual advocacy days on our Facebook page at www dot facebook dot com slash the Arkoff washington state we are also recording each week and will post the recorded sessions on our website at www dot arqua dot org finally i want to ask where people are from please type what county you are from in the chat box with that I'll turn it back over to Diana Staden to continue on with our program. So right now we're going to introduce the groups that have helped bring this and put it together for you. Um, Stacy, would you like to talk about the ARC? Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. <laughs> uh, welcome to our first virtual advocacy days. I'm so excited that everybody's here. Um, I'm, the, I'm Stacey Dim. I'm the Executive Director at the ARC of Washington State. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the ARC is a national organization that promotes and protects the human and civil rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, ensuring their full inclusion and participation in all aspects of community. We have eight local county-based chapters across Washington, and we've been around as a nonprofit since 1936. So some 80, 85, four years now. <laughs> the ARC is, is really known for pioneering innovative programs and services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and encouraging progressive governmental policies that promote independence, self-sufficiency and inclusion. Um, and then at the, the end of the day, a lot of what we do is informing and educating society about the enduring potential and inherent value of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, which we hope to do here with all of you. So thank you again and welcome. So Adrian, would you like to share about the DDC? Hi everyone, I'm Adrian Stewart with the Developmental Disabilities Council. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. There's so many people on the call who contribute so so much to this community and 
who, like me, are really passionate um, about being here and doing this work. So thank you for being here. Um, there's a Developmental Disabilities Council in <clears throat> basically every state. Um, and we uh, exist, we have a federal state partnership uh, working um, to plan for and with uh, people with developmental disabilities and their families. Um, pretty much uh, about two thirds of folks who are on our council are either have a um, developmental disability themselves or are a family member of somebody with a disability. So we all um, bring our unique lived experience uh, which informs this work. Um, and we partner with uh, other organizations like the ARC of Washington State to uh, advocate for community-based services for people with disabilities and their families. And we also do a lot of educating um, of uh, policymakers and, and candidates and um, other community groups so that they understand they're oriented in the services um, that are being provided and understand the gap. So again, thank you so much for being here and for participating. I, I'm really looking forward to this. Great, and Jessica, would you like to talk about SAIL? Yes. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, introduce our two legislative guests today. We have Senator Ann Rivers from the 18th District, that's down in Clark County, and then Representative Tim Ormsby from the Spokane area. Senator Rivers, would you like to introduce yourself? You bet. I'm Senator Ann Rivers from Washington's 18th Legislative District. My district encompasses many of the small communities that surround the city of Vancouver. In fact, I have a small part of the city of Vancouver in my district. Uh, I'm proud to uh, have um, been raised with a, a developmentally disabled person, and so I feel like uh, I have a heart for the kinds of uh, joys and challenges that um, you all face. And I'm, I'm really proud to be part of the leadership team several years ago that uh, diminished the waiting list. Um, 
I'm, I'm looking with a rather jaundiced eye at some of the gubernatorial propositions for budget cuts uh, and, uh, and maintain close contacts within our DD community down here in Southwest so that uh, I'm kept abreast. But I'm so grateful to be here with you today and I look forward to a robust discussion. And Representative Ormsby, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, thank you and, and good morning. Uh, my name is Tim Ormsby. Uh, I live in the city of Spokane and represent the third legislative district, uh, which is uh, about two thirds of the city of Spokane, almost entirely within the city of Spokane. Uh, I am uh, currently the chair of the House Appropriations Committee, the Budget Committee. And just, just a little background on myself, I, uh, I grew up in a large family. I was one of uh, eight boys. Uh, when what I learned right away was uh, that it was not about me, that it was actually about the success of, uh, of our family uh, as a unit and that where any one of us went, we all went. Uh, and the idea of uh, stepping over folks on our way to success was not, not part of the family that I grew up in and and I think it's our obligation in government to provide opportunities for success for all of our folks and that is the lens through which uh, I view the public policy and budget decisions that we make uh, and I'm happy to be here uh, answer questions and provide uh, any clarity uh, on any of the issues that are impacting people's lives uh, that are providing opportunities for them to advance or creating challenges and barriers uh, towards advancement. So I'm very much looking forward to your presentations and questions. Thank you. Thank you both for being here today. And Can so I ask Diana? I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. I was going to ask, so this is the first of uh, several uh, of these uh, panels that you're doing. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, that's correct. We have six of these set up and we have two different legislators for each week um, so that we can try and cover various districts and parts of the state as well as um, mostly budget people who are on one of the budget committees since that's the big topic right now. Okay, happy to be part of the guinea pig part of this thing. <laughs> And I know, I know from having been responsible for running some of these things, there, it, you know, believe me, there's nothing that I haven't already experienced or been responsible for uh, as far as making uh, errors and technology going bad. So uh, thanks for having us. Well, I appreciate that because we've already got one panelist who cannot get in using her link. So she's an attendee, but we'll get her questions for you that way. Okay. So thanks for being patient with us. So um, at this point, we are gonna go through some slides. This first one here uh, is about the developmental disability services. And many of them are found under the Developmental Disabilities Administration, um, but not all. They're kind of scattered through different agencies. And so you can see that we have our waivers, the home and community-based services waivers that are under DDA. Um, in those waivers, we have community residential for people, uh, employment and day services, their case management services. Um, we also have the enhanced respite um, for children and the overnight planned respite for adults. And then the four um, intermediate care facilities and nursing facilities that we call uh, residential habilitation centers or RHCs are also under DDA. And all of our services within DDA come with the federal match. Uh, most of it is 50-50 match, half state money, half federal money, um, except for our personal care or what's called community first choice, that gets an extra 6% match. Um, we get services under aging and long-term care. Um, the residential care services, all the oversight is under aging. And then our 
personal care services are under aging. We have employment supports through DVR and food stamps, background checks, some other pieces under DSHS. And then we have our early support for infants and toddlers or ESIT is under Department of Early Learning. We have education and special education services. Under the healthcare authority is where our medical stuff lies. And then under the Department of Health, we have the neurodevelopmental centers. Uh, Adrian, would you like to talk about this slide? Okay, I, I think I'm unmute. I'm gonna assume I'm unmuted, but I don't yes, know for are. sure. Okay, great. Um, so uh, yeah, um, the county numbers are here on the slide. Um, so I can just uh, talk about them a little bit. I'm not in these counties, but we did try and pull these county numbers for to, uh, pertaining to the representative and the participants on the call. Um, so the total number of DDA clients enrolled in Spokane is a little over 1,200 kids and um, almost 3,000 adults. Um, down in Clark County, you've got over 1,400 kids and almost 1,500 adults um, enrolled in DDA um, services. And um, then we have what's called the no paid services caseload. Um, and we have to call it that because uh, we can't call it a wait list. But um, so technically that is uh, what it's called. But these are folks who have qualified um, for services but are put on a, um, a no paid services caseload. There's no case management attached to that list. Um, but they, they do qualify for services nonetheless and uh, are unable to access them. So over in Spokane um, with Representative Ormsby, you've got uh, about 3,000 um, folks that are um, on the pay. And Diana, can you say the, the difference between the paid and the no paid um, numbers here? Sure. I thought these were just the, yeah, go ahead. Sure, the, the paid services are somebody who is getting one paid service at least from DBA. And okay. no paid services are just that, the no, the on a list, and okay. they get no services whatsoever. So you've got a little over a thousand people over there that aren't getting any services um, and, and 3,000 who just get the one paid. Could that be the community first choice, Diana? Yeah, like the, a, yeah. I think they're getting one paid service, yeah. Okay, all right, but they wouldn't be qualify for the waiver, right? They, they may not. Some of yeah. them may be on waivers, but if they're just getting personal care and are on a request list is what they call it, if right. you want a waiver spot, but there's not one open. And then down in Clark County, you've got almost a thousand folks on the no paid services um, caseload. So. Thanks, Adrian. And there was, oh, we'll get to questions at the end. Did you already say that, Diana? We're doing I, the questions at the Jessica end. Jessica covered that. Okay. Okay, Stacy, would you like to talk about the budget? Yeah, hi. Uh, this, so this is our DDA biennial budget. Uh, as you can see, with about $1.8 billion in state general funds, and then a matching federal amount of about $1.8 billion. Adam had estimated about 120,000 people with developmental disabilities in our state. There are about 50,000 people enrolled in DDA services. So you can see that we only serve about a third of the children and adults that we would expect to see needing services sort of in the DD system. Uh, as Adrian mentioned, we have a no paid services caseload, uh, which is 14,000 people-ish um, who have asked for help from DDA, they're eligible for help from DDA, uh, and they wait for services. Our DDA, just as a side note, doesn't provide any housing or crisis or emergency services in our state. So the graph to the left shows by dollars and percent what's spent on each program that DDA actually does provide. And as you can see, most of the funds are spent on community residential services like supported living, group homes, and other residential services, and in-home support through home and community-based waivers. So that includes services like respite and supported employment. Uh, the majority of people do live in their community and in their homes um, in, our, in our developmental disabilities world. Um, 
As you can see, about 13% of the budget is spent on RHCs or our state institutions with about 551 long-term residents in those facilities. There are about 67 residents in RHCs though that are ready to leave and they have no community placement available to them across the state. Uh, we have also have about seven people stuck in the hospitals and 53 DDA eligibles stuck in psychiatric facilities that are looking for more permanent places to get support. Uh, and there are about 256 DDA eligible clients in nursing home facilities right now, separate from the RHCs. Uh, generally speaking, because it's, it's relevant to the furloughs and things that are happening, there are about 4,000 state employees at DDA, uh, most of whom will be furloughed, including case managers who offer a vital connection to the families and individuals who live in the community. And we have a workforce of over 20,000 direct support professionals who are on the front lines every day working with individuals with disabilities um, in our communities. Um, and that's both in community residential um, and then some in-home services and supports. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Stacy. Okay, so we're gonna talk about some of the proposed cuts right now that DDA has. They were told that they need to do 15%, which is about $140 million. Um, the, the three that you see highlighted are the ones that are going to make the most damage within families. Um, reducing the number of clients eligible for services by changing the eligibility. This is supposed to remove thousands of people from service. Uh, people who've been on waivers for years and they're now older adults and really needing those services could suddenly lose all their waiver services. They would no longer qualify. And the way that they've talked about doing that is currently you have to have first the diagnosis that fits for the state. Um, and then second, you have to have a certain number of activities of daily living or ADLs um, in order to qualify. And so a person, you have to have at least three so maybe they need help with bathing and they need help with um, food, food preparation and that kind of thing and feeding. And maybe they need toileting help. So they got three things right there. But in order to be able to change the eligibility, they're talking about they have to have two additional ones besides that. So if they made um, their eligibility on those three, now they suddenly have to add two more. They got to fit into two more quality. <laughs> Sorry, I'm tripping over my words here. Um, categories. So this is really going to be a real harmful thing to people. I mean, people rely on those waiver services. Um, some people need them to, you know, get them out of bed and be able to get up and go out in the community, go to a job. Um, so that's really going to be hard. And then they're talking about reducing the number of waiver slots that we have right now, um, the people that are on those, and not allowing any new placements on a waiver. And we have people who go into crisis, and that sometimes is the only way they can get services is to be in crisis and be placed on a waiver, but that won't be available anymore. And then reducing the number of respite hours. In our state, 80% of individuals live with their families and their families provide most of the care for them. And if they, the only thing they ask for is a little break once in a while. Um, you know, we have people, elderly people who are in their 70s and 80s caring for an adult son or daughter with developmental disabilities. And they've been doing it for 50 years. And they just want a break so that they can get away, go, you know, grocery shopping, get things done, um, you know, things like that. So those respite hours are really important to families. And they're important to the state because the family saved them so much money by not requesting out of home placements. So we're going to delay some of the other things that we got last legislative session. Um, and so you can see those things on here. Meaningful day programs. People are stuck in their homes right now with COVID. 
and most of us can figure out things to do. But for people who are in adult family homes, some type of residential like that, those meaningful day programs come in and help them have something to do and be occupied. And they don't want to lose those. So we're looking at some of the smaller things, you know, but those top three are really huge and crucial to individuals in the community. Jessica? Are you having problems getting it going? Yeah, if you want, Jessica, Diana or I can go over the slide if you're having trouble. I don't. These are some additional cuts being proposed for the DDA budget. They include a much needed rate increase for supported living so we can move the 47 plus residents in the RHCs and have a placement in the community for them to move to. It also would cut rates and staffing that is needed to address the crisis of people with IT who are stuck in hospitals and need a place to go. A piece that DDA included in their proposal was to close the RHC known as Rainier and consolidate cottages at the other RHCs. Self-advocates are very happy about this, although it won't save money this year. Savings will start showing up in about two years. Thanks, Jessica. Stacy. So there, as uh, Diana showed in that previous slide, we take cuts in multiple ways, not just through DDA um, in the, these proposed exercises. And some lie in the healthcare authority. Uh, this happens every time we go through a, a budget cutting process very essential, quote, optional services like dental therapy and interpreter services um, are first on the chopping block. And um, as you can imagine, not receiving these services is pretty devastating for our community. Uh, within Alta, we have a number of people who are eligible for DDA services, but can't get services there and sometimes end up in the Alta system. Uh, most um, well known would be through an adult family home uh, Alta is also looking at very significant changes. Um, and because, uh, I'll just take a note, uh, because DDA and Alta both are taking federal money, FMAP money right now and CARES money, they can't make any cuts until December. So the proposed 15% cuts would really end up being a 30% cut from January to July next year. Um, and that includes changes, very severe changes in eligibility, which just eliminates people from service eliminating adult day health and adult day care, um, and eliminating meaningful day programs in residential, which um, as, as Diana pointed out, we, we all know the effects of isolation at this point. Uh, and for those residents in adult family homes, they have no way to get out and about in the community without this program. Uh, in addition, it, it challenges a provider to be able to provide the care that they need at this point. And then lastly, through the Department of Health, uh, there are cuts to the neurodevelopmental centers and there are about 18 neurodevelopmental centers in the state of Washington. They serve about 19,000 children uh, across the state. Uh, they, this will have a significant impact on these small babies and supporting their families. And it will affect pr families primarily using Medicaid to, to access services. Thanks, Diana. Okay, and Jessica, would you like to talk about this slide? This slide compares the rising cost of housing an individual in the Residential Habilitation Centers or RHC with the declining number of residents each year. The blue columns represent the number of people who live there permanently and the gold columns are the number of clients who are there short term such as for crisis stabilization or respite. Costs keep rising. 
especially for 2020 with the part of Rainier decertified by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, meaning it no longer gets federal matching dollars for that portion. Also, 47 people are currently waiting and approved to move out of an RHC and into the community, but there are no open placements available. As of July 1, 2020, there are only 551 long-term placements in the RHCs. Thank you, Jessica. Now, I want to remind everybody, I've seen a lot of questions in the Q&A box, and we are going to get to those a little bit later. But first, we want to have some of the legislators' constituents talk for a couple minutes and then give legislators a chance to respond to that. So uh, let's start with Risa. Would you like to share a little bit and say what district that you're in? You need to unmute yourself, Risa. Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Thank you. My name is Risa Hayes, and I'm from Spokane. I don't know what district I am, but Tim, thank you for being here today, and thank you for the other legislator from Vancouver for being here today, too. Um, just, um, Diane, would you please let me know when I'm coming down to a one minute mark, please? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I am an individual who lives on my own in, uh, in Spokane. I am, uh, work part-time part for People First of Washington and I'm also on sale and um, these cuts would be dramatically devastating, not just for me, but for everybody across Washington state. Um, had a, I have caregivers coming in seven days a week, two hours a day, and on Saturday, uh, uh, two and a half hours. Now, I um, ha I had a little incident about a year or so ago about bed bugs. Well, I the bed bug problem was that I um, had a had a new mattress and. I didn't even know it was infested with bed bugs. Well, we all know that care caregivers can't come in during the time that bed bugs are here to to infect to in um, infest them them or their families. So I was without a caregiver for a month. But I got through it because I had friends and family members that came in and helped me. Mostly friends because my family lives all over the place. I mean, my brother lived out in Davenport. Well, he has a farm that he's farming and stuff. But anyway, during that month, during that month, I could, get, I could do things but not as efficiently with a caregiver. Now, now, I know families, I know other family members that have more significant um, disabilities with their um, sons, daughters, or with themselves that need more care. And if the cuts happen, like this, it's really devastating. And if you think COBA, COBA is devastating, try without services for life, it's gonna 
it's going to devastate us for for life. And the transportation, I use use paratransit and I use the fixed routes. And without those, then hey, that's pretty bad. So I I urge you, please, 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 please take into consideration, not just me, but for everybody else that needs these services. 15% is a lot of cuts and just please don't do that to us. Thank please. you, Lisa. That was really good. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to bring on Amy Lind, and she um, didn't quite make it into the panelist piece, but I, I'm bringing her in through the attendees piece. So Amy, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how these cuts will affect your family? Sure. Um, I'm Amy Lind, and uh, I am a guardian now to my sister Annie. And Annie is uh, 56 years old. Both of our parents have passed. And uh, I'm just so thankful to have this opportunity to talk to Representative Ornsby. Annie is in the third district. I live in Deer Park, so I'm, I'm seventh. But Annie is definitely affected by what happens within the third district. And thank you, Senator Rivers, as well. And I'm going to try and speak as well as Stacy Dunn. I, Dunn, I just thought she did a fabulous job there. But um, I would um, say that Annie has been in supported living with the Arcus Spokane since 1986. So really at the get-go of, of when that was started. She's lived in many houses, had many roommates. She leads an active and full life. Um, she's had wonderful caring people around her to keep her safe and sound. She uses all of those uh, services, financial management, supported employment, community centers, supported transportation, uh, Spokane Parks and Recs, all of those services are, Annie utilizes those very well and they're a big part of her life. Um, she needs help with her daily living skills, taking baths, getting dressed, shopping, preparing meals, um, cutting meat or, or handling knives of any kind and household chores. She also needs supervision in the public because Annie has never met a stranger. Um, she trusts everyone the same and she did, would not even recognize if someone was dangerous or unsafe. She is just a loving, um, joyful, kind person. Um, and so to lose the support and be forced out of her community, out of all of these things she's had for, for decades, um, to be isolated and alone would be horrible for her. In fact, this COVID isolation thing has been horrible for her. She calls me daily. When, when do I get to go back to the center? When can I get my hair cut? When can I have lunch with you? When, when, when? She is, she is ready. <laughs> ready for this uh, isolation period to be over because uh, for her, she has to wait till stage three to, to even come out of that. Um, my husband and I work full time. Uh, I'm a kindergarten teacher. Um, our adult sons work and go to school and Annie's needs are significant enough that we could never leave her home alone safely. So she still will need supported living, supported employment, the community centers, transportation, financial management, Spokane Parks and Recs. She needs all of that to lead a safe and happy life. And taking these cuts uh, from the DD community is just heartbreaking to me. And I'm hoping that we can find a different way to balance the budget other than through DD dollars. We, they are so needed and so important for the daily living of, of um, for my sister, just so important. Thank you, so, Amy. You bet. Okay, so um, real quick, we're gonna do a poll so that we can figure out what roles we have um, for our atten for attendees. Uh, and so 
this poll is finding out who you are. Are you a self-advocate, a family member, a service provider, a policy maker? We know we have two of those. <laughs> or maybe just an ally in the community for people with DD. As you can see, we're get, getting a lot of family members here on this one. Okay, and it looks like people are, are finished with their polling. So we have 53% of the attendees are family members, 27% uh, are service providers, 10% are the self-advocates we have here, and then 8% are people that are just interested in this issue and want to help people with developmental disabilities keep their services. So thank you, everybody. So let's move on to District 18. And Debbie, would you unmute yourself and share a little bit about what these cuts would mean to you? Okay, my name is Debbie Case. Um... I am a mother of three adult children. Timothy Case is my middle son who has Down syndrome. He's 27. Six years ago when he finished his um, respite program in um, Camas, he uh, was extremely lonely. I had no idea what we were going to do. Had Just we had no plan. And there was no plan in place. There was just he would basically sit by the door and be sad. And it was awful. We've worked very hard with our community, with our caseworker. Um, Timothy now lives a very full life. He works two days a week. He has activities through Vancouver Parks and Rec, a program that's here in Clark, I guess, kind of in the Southwest Washington as I embrace. He participates in daily programs, um, a day program with that that includes community guide and our community, yeah, community guide and respite, which is, you know, I'm his primary caregiver. My husband um, flies. <laughs> Matter of fact, he's right here. He's supposed to be going to embrace right now, but he's waiting for me to help him. So anyway, I... <laughs> I think the COVID thing has shown us what this would look like without support. It was the first couple of weeks he was fine, but after that, he was extremely lonely again. And as much as we tried as a family to keep him active and doing things, clearly you know, because he has Down syndrome and concern about vulnerability, we, you know, did what everybody was supposed to do. I think. In light of that, now that things are kind of coming back in our area a little bit, um, he's able to do some of the restrictive stuff that they can do through I Embrace, and he's back to work two days a week, kind of on and off. It's just a weekly. It's different every every uh, every week. I I think the thing is is that he's happier. His his whole life has come back again. He misses his friends. He misses the Kate, the people he works with. He adores the people he works with. And to lose that has been um, really hard on our family and most importantly, hard on him. He was scheduled to do a week long trip, which we don't ever get a, you know, we don't ever get a week separate from each other. <laughs> and he was supposed to do that at Kiwanis camp. And of course that's been canceled because of COVID. And it just makes me realize that if we lost some of the ability for him to do these things, um, it would it just it it would not it would make for a very difficult life. My husband does work for the airlines, so we do get to travel. This is what this picture is. That's my son, but his little face keeps showing up in the picture. Um, he's a great young man, and he is just his life is enhanced by the things that DDA helps to provide for him. We are looking at retirement. And so although we haven't had to participate in, we haven't been able or haven't participated in some of the Medicare um, 
uh, health things for Timothy, we will be participating in that more um, in retirement. So I just, it makes me sad in my heart to see, I did not realize how much we would be losing in this. I knew we were gonna lose some. It makes me extremely sad to see that um, people will not have access to some of the things that you know we can participate in. Those things will go away. I mean, that's the bottom line. If they can't get the participants, they'll go away. And we work really hard as a community to have this for our adults. Because after high school and those programs, it's gone. They have nothing to do. So anyway. Thank you, Debbie. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, and then we have Alex and his dad, John, who are gonna join us. Okay, hey bud, come on, you need to go down. Hello, hey, Senator Rivers. I don't know if you remember me, but we met back in February in Olympia, I believe uh, your LA Michael through a series of emails set up a meeting for you and uh, you were pulled off the floor to, uh, to talk with me and uh, I found it quite exciting advocating in Olympia. And uh, I definitely want you to put your power and intensity into helping us because we've had to fight long and hard. And by we, I'm Alex's guardian. So we, us, I, you, uh, it all kind of means the same thing. It's all one thing. And we've had to fight and work really hard to get the help we have so far, and even though we are getting some help and services, et cetera, uh, it's not enough, we need more, not less, to say the least. And Alex, uh, well, Alex is 20, and he just graduated from Union High School, June 18th, mm -hmm. go Titans. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's gonna be doing the transition program next year. So we're, we're hoping and dreaming that there's gonna be services that help him get out into life on his own and uh, uh, so he can prosper better without necessarily depending on me on a daily basis, hourly basis, minute by minute basis sometimes. Uh, and his uh, case manager, John Arnold at Union has definitely said that Alex is gonna need some form of help the rest of his life. And uh, he, uh, well, any cuts are unacceptable. I mean, we want, we want more, so any cuts are unacceptable. And because Alex, I, I get a really bad feeling that Alex is gonna be in the cuts and it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be really hard on everybody because the bottom line is he's not gonna have me forever. I'm 42 years older than he is, and I'm gonna die someday. And uh, I mean, where is that gonna leave Alex uh, with a mental health crisis? Uh, he's like, where do a lot of people with mental health crises live? On the street. And so cutting services now, I think is just gonna create more expense later and more problems later add to more problems. So uh, any cuts at all just aren't acceptable. And Alex is also a registered voter, as I am. And I don't know, Alex, you want to throw anything out there? No? no? Mm -hmm. Nothing to say? Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Um, I do know that Alex has been <laughs> uh, getting pretty bored with quarantining. Uh, we all, uh, well, it used to be youth, youth group and his church services on Sunday and we're a little hard to get him out into the world on his own because Alex has, uh, Alex has severe, uh, well, when Alex was six days old, he had a traumatic brain injury and seven hour craniotomy, they removed a small portion of his right frontal lobe. So Alex has incredible memory problems. So uh, we're still believing in gloves as well as masks. Uh, and especially in 
bathrooms in public if you have to use them. Uh, and when someone has tremendous memory issues, uh, remembering to wear a mask, remembering to bring a mask, uh, it, all, it, it all becomes more complex and complicated. So even, so now in this COVID-19 era, uh, help is even more necessary. So we just, I don't know, it's just more help is needed and less help is unacceptable. And Alex doesn't really have anything to say and I could, I could go on and it's just, it's just the more I think about it, the more it infuriates me and the only way that we have to fight is, uh, well, I guess we look at who votes for what, and that's going to start determining, that's going to be our primary decision making come voting time, filling out the ballots. And as I mentioned, well, I was, uh, Alex actually was in Olympia with uh, my wife's stepmother, who's his caregiver. And uh, all three of us were in Olympia twice this year. And then I went up once, uh, well, that was actually with Ruth's Union, which were also uh, uh, looking at cuts on the caregiving end as well as the services end. So we're, we're kind of seeing both ends in the middle, so to speak, on this. So we're, we're active with the union fighting for caregiver benefits because as I was telling people in Olympia in February, the better environment we make for caregivers, the better environment of caregiving we're gonna have. And I hate to tell this everybody, but uh, sooner or later, everybody's gonna need some form of caregiving before they, before they leave this world because no one gets out alive. It's just not the way it works. So it's cuts all around are just gonna devastate quality of life and forward movement into semi-independent living, which is what I think we both are, are dreaming of, but not before it's time. And it's a lot of uh, groundwork getting laid to get to that point. So uh, it, it's just, you no, know, we're just, I guess, uh, well, if we ever get to go back to Olympia and advocate and lobby in person, uh, We'll certainly be back there to do that, but I don't think COVID-19 is going away anytime soon. So it's gonna be more Zoom meetings and emails and Facebook marketing or whatever they call it. And uh, just doing whatever we can to have our voices heard. And it just seems, it seems to me that the BD community facing a 15% cut, it just seems like the most vulnerable are being discriminated against. And then I hear that K through 12 public school is untouchable. And I just uh, have a hard time swallowing that as well. I, I don't understand everything. And we kind of got into a lot of these, uh, well, the DDA and just uh, getting involved with peace and the various programs there. Alex has been doing a class there and I've been doing a class and we kind of got into it a little late. So we're relatively new into the potential services, but uh, as far as being caregiving and have problems, well, we've been doing that for, for 20 years. And Alex also, even though he needs help and it's been a, is getting some caregiving. Alex is also, as well as I have been a caregiver for a long time as well, because his mother had uh, serious health issues uh, before she passed away four years ago. So Alex has seen both sides of caregiving and giving care in whatever capacity it is. And, Thank uh, you, John. We really okay. appreciate you sharing your stories and grateful that both you and Alex could join us. Um, we want to move on with our program so we have a chance to hear from everybody. There's lots of questions out there on the Q&A and hands raised and we really appreciate that everybody's being patient and we will get to those 
questions in a few minutes, but I'm going to turn it over to Stacy right now. Thank you again to the speakers. You know, I know how hard it is to share your personal story with everybody, especially on a Zoom call. Um, so I'm grateful for your, your bravery and your willingness to do that. Um, I do, I want to take a brief moment, Representative Ornfe and Senator Rivers, to just, and everybody in this audience to, to recognize that we continue to be knee deep in the pandemic. Uh, and many of us are tired in so many ways. Uh, some of us have experienced COVID ourselves. Some of us have lost loved ones to the virus and are grieving. Um, people with developmental disabilities are four times more likely to be infected by the virus. And in our state, three times more likely to die from COVID. Uh, so our community has um, some disproportionate effect uh, around the virus. Many people with IDD have underlying conditions. Um, over 4,500 live in a group care setting where the risk is high because of caregivers who often work more than one job um, and who care for people in more than one setting. So, so our community, as you can hear, is really struggling with the isolation, sometimes with the face covering requirements, the loss of jobs, um, and when the loss of routine that so many people with IDD really depend on. Um, so I, I, you know, it's interesting to me that uh, we have this going on and yet now we're very distracted by and focused on how it could be worse, uh, which would be if these cuts were to come into play. And we know this is a very difficult time for you um, as a public servant and there's not a lot of easy answers here. Um, so we're grateful again that you're here willing to Kind of sort this out with us and talk with us a little bit. Um, you know, we these are the most historic cuts I think our state has ever seen. Uh, and we were 41st in the nation in spending for developmental disabilities before all this began. Um, we were only serving the most severely disabled and those in crisis before the pandemic. Uh, we were definitely a system in crisis that walked into this new situation. Uh, we have, as you've heard, a, a pretty extensive group of people who've asked for help and are waiting for help. Uh, and our, our system is really going to be devastated if we decide that we're going to solve this problem through cuts. And I think most of us believe uh, and are quite aware, if you look at the math, that we can't cut our way out of this problem. Uh, that there'll have to be a need for revenue. And uh, even the rainy day fund, which I think is at about three and a half billion dollars, even if you use every dime of that, it's not going to solve our eight point eight billion dollar shortfall. Uh, so I guess we're hoping that if ever there's a time the word special is going to matter to our population, that it'll be now. You'll see us as a very special population that probably needs to have its issues um, resolved without cuts through the rainy day fund, hopefully as a priority. Um, and that you'll help us figure out how to work with you on raising revenue and reducing the impact uh, to our community. Uh, we also have the issue of some federal funds that are flowing through through CARES and FMAP that right now are kind of hung up um, and are not necessarily flowing to the people they were intended to. And so I just want to kind of lay that, that groundwork and um, see if, if you all have either questions about some of the things you've heard today for all of us or um, some comments that you might want to make based on the, the information that you have going forward. Um, and Senator Rivers, I'm wondering if we could start with you. You bet. Um, first of all, I appreciate your, um, your willingness to talk about revenue. I am not in the uh, group of people who think that we have to have new revenue. I am in the group of people who think that it's time for us to talk about priorities of government. We know that um, we are called by our state constitution to take care of our most vulnerable. So why is it that every time we run into a budget hardship, we cut our most vulnerable? Um, I think that that's extraordinarily unacceptable. And in fact, the uh, budgets that we passed to bring us out of the, uh, the Great Recession uh, funded our disabled community at a much higher rate than it had been funded. It didn't get all the way back, but, um, but we certainly made that a priority. And to me, and, and I'm not putting a knock on anybody, I'm just talking about 
what my priorities have been and, and the things that I see. Um, uh, why are we not closing the RHCs, which are a huge money suck? Um, why, uh, why are we not demanding that the governor give the rest of the money from the Climate Resiliency Fund? We have to put people before pet projects. And um, I, we've made motion towards SOLAs. We have to get that done because we can no longer have people stuck in the hospital. But for me, here's another, this really chaps my hide too. The reality is the number two cause of admit to the emergency room in the state of Washington is dental issues. It's about $13,000 per admit charge to the emergency department. So we're gonna cut dental on the front end for people who really need it. So they end up going to the emergency room where we're gonna pay a whole bunch more on the back end. These are the kinds of things I don't believe that we need uh, new taxes. I don't. And I am familiar with um, Senator Peterson's comments recently in the media about the implementation of an income tax. Many people say, oh, an income tax is not constitutional. If you read the Constitution, what you know is that a graduated income tax is unconstitutional. Yeah, a graduated income tax is unconstitutional. So the solution is that everyone pays one or two or maybe three percent. Everyone who gets money, everyone. So we're going to take the workers who are working to take care of people, we're gonna ax 5% for union dues right off the top. We'll take another one to 3%. Now we're looking at a 10% about reduction in their wages. So I think that if we are surgical, if we are smart, if we start looking at pet projects, I think we can get where we need to be, take care of our most vulnerable, as we are called to do by our, um, by our constitution, uh, and, um, and not have to impose more taxes on people who can ill afford to pay more taxes. When we raise taxes, we see a couple things happen. We see a retraction in the economy, um, and uh, because people can't spend their money the way that they want to spend their money. Um, and we see people leave. And uh, all you have to do is look at the, uh, the um, real estate reports from, from Texas and from Idaho to see that people are leaving our state because they don't like the instability here. Uh, we need a robust economy to be able to, to um, take care of our constitutional mandates. It's the paramount duty of the state to fully fund K through 12 education. We must take care of our most vulnerable. We must provide for, for uh, infrastructure, these kinds of things. So I believe we can do that, but I, and I'm thrilled to be on this call with you today because I want you as advocates to demand more, to say, don't hold us hostage for your tax increases. Don't make us go out there and be your army to demand tax increases, because we can do this without tax increases. We just have to prioritize. And that's all I have for you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Rivers. I appreciate your comments. And it's good to know where your thinking is on this. We're, we're all curious about each legislator is thinking about this and we're, we're grateful for your candid response. Um, uh, Representative Ornfee, I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts might be. Oh, thanks, Stacey. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, talking about the uh, proposed, uh, the exercise that the state agencies went through at the Office of Financial Management's directive to do a 15% cut exercise and that's what it is it's it's an exercise and i think it's as much psychological as it is practical knowing that we have this steep revenue drop that is going to affect state government programs and services and 
the reckoning that is going to be required for those of us that were here during the Great Recession, it took a, it took very sophisticated thinkers a good deal of time to come to grips with the devastation of that size of revenue shortfall. And I think this, this does not have the force of law. This uh, does not uh, write the book on what we would do uh, with this type of revenue shortfall that we're seeing, but it does indicate to all of you in this world, to all of the folks uh, that touch state programs and services, the uh, how very real the situation is. So I, th in my estimation, it is as much in preparation for folks to deal with the eventuality uh, that we're going to face as it does anything else. And and Stacy, to your comments about being knee deep in things, I would have hoped uh, that given the scientific data out there that, and this is one of the things we can't predict is human behavior about your comment about being knee deep in COVID. And it kind of goes back to the, to the three priorities, which we haven't really been able to address and put behind us, which is the spread of the contagion. Uh, it's getting worse in Washington state. It's getting worse where I live in uh, the city of Spokane and Spokane County. If we can't address the spread of the contagion, everything else is academic. So in terms of priorities, that's the first thing that is between us and improvements. If we want, we have to mask up to open up is the message. We are going to have to do all of those public health, those simple things that we would tell our kindergarten age children, neighbors, grandchildren, etc., cetera, uh, about the things that we need to do and human behavior, uh, given what it is, the vagaries of what people do. The next kind of priority after that is just the basic life, health and safety things, which you have all been commenting on shelter and food, uh, feeling safe in your community. And, and the third thing was what can government do standing between vulnerable people and the abyss? And a lot of that is uh, unemployment insurance, for example, getting money in people's pockets to pay bills, to be able to engage in the economy in some way uh, so that the anxiety that folks go through for making rent, for uh, paying a utility bill, for buying groceries, all of those things, at least they can put those things aside in their world of things that cause anxiety. Uh, I'll uh, go to the budget situation, uh, which, and I would say this is a 95% science, 5% art exercise. I think the science speaks for itself. Uh, there's no arguing with the arithmetic, uh, but the art part of it is something we should focus on. And that is what, what outcome, what end result do we want to get? Fill in the blank of many, many different responsibilities of state government and interests of our residents. Focus on the outcome. What can we do on the outcome? And I, I was, uh, I was very interested to see the map of services, whether it's in uh, the Developmental Disabilities Administration, whether it was in Aging and Long-Term Care Services Administration, whether it was in HCA or the Department of Health. You see this weather system of programs and services. I imagine that it's very difficult to navigate, uh, but they were all, that structure was all set up to deliver services and set up in, for very good reasons, it may be time to just focus on what the outcome is and figure out what roles those agencies have and not being parochial about insisting, this is what we do, you can't do this, and just focus on outcomes for individuals and families. That's what we need to do. And the structures to me are less important, but they're the only thing we know. So it's gonna be a very, uh, arduous cultural shift for folks in state government, for those who are used to receiving services through this mechanism or another, it's gonna be a difficult transition for all of us. 
And I will end my comments on the revenue question. And then I just had a couple of questions myself. And I appreciate, uh, Stacy, your comments about resources. And resources could be the rainy day fund. It could be the ending fund balance. Revenue is the question. And I'm just going to comment that our revenue system is awful. It is awful. And these times demonstrate why. We're a very consumption-based revenue system. So when things, when the economy is good, people are buying things that generate sales tax, like cars and washers and dryers and clothing and other things. Those, folks aren't buying those things right now because of the uncertainty. So if 50% of the money that comes into the state is based on consumer confidence, this is not the time to rely on sales tax. I do believe that we need new revenue uh, and I want to have a sophisticated conversation, given how awful our tax system is, on where that money comes from and who is in the position to pay. So the fact that we do not want to target in a regressive fashion folks that can least afford to pay it, I don't think anyone will argue with that. But let's not put that in between us and a robust, rigorous, honest conversation about where the money comes from. So yes, I can think of, and I think we would all agree about who we don't want to target, but there, uh, but f there are folks in a great position to be able to contribute more to our commonwealth, to our ability to act uh, as a civil society. And I am for that. And those conversations are occurring. I am not allergic to the difficulty of that, I would love to dive headfirst and address those issues uh, having to do with revenue because, and this is our problem, and this is my last science part of this, uh, is that the revenue shortfall that was estimated for us uh, earlier, I'm gonna, I guess it was last month, a couple of weeks ago, uh, for this biennium, which is a two year period, our shortfall is about $4.5 billion which is a huge chunk of the state budget. We own, and that's over a two year period, that 4.5 billion, but we're already halfway through that two year period as of yesterday. So we have got to solve that problem in one year. You take all of the budget stabilization account, the rainy day fund, the ending fund balance, that's three of that 4.5. That means we have nothing left in reserve. That still leaves a problem statement of a billion and a half dollars. And that is going to be a challenge. So even if I had a magic wand and could institute uh, unilaterally a more progressive revenue system, the mechanism to fill the billion and a half dollars in one year does not exist because you just simply can't turn a switch and have that revenue come to the state and go out in the form of programs and services. It takes time. I believe that there will be a short term relying on our current tax system, which I don't like, but it's the, it's the system that's available to us to fund programs and services. Things like sales tax, property tax, B&O tax, real estate excise tax, uh, you know, estate tax, inheritance tax. Uh, tobacco tax, liquor tax, marijuana, you know, those things that already exist to come up with uh, what bridges this short-term gap in one year. I also think that we need to institute a more progressive system uh, to, for, the, for the period after that. So we have this bridge, short-term bridge period, if we have to fill part of that gap. And believe me, there is no pathway to filling that gap with revenue only. So there are gonna be expenditure reductions and I just have to be honest about that. I, t I, get, I derive no pleasure in saying that. This budget is what it is and the improvements in the DD budget are there because that's what our members wanted, that's what their constituents wanted and that is the budget that we developed in response to that. So that is our preference. We had that really good budget for three days this year, March, 13th, 14th, and 15th until bars and restaurants got closed down on Sunday the 15th, and we started into this whole COVID odyssey. So we're, it is going to be a mix of expenditure reductions, 
and revenue in order to solve the problem. I don't see any way out of that. That is my interpretation of very simple arithmetic. A couple of questions that I had, and I heard a couple of numbers about folks that are in RHCs that are ready uh, to leave, and I'm not sure what ready to leave means, but I heard 67 and 47 as far as those folks that could transition to the community, were they able to? And what is the holdup? And my experience is that it has to do with the rates that we are willing to pay providers for the, um, uh, um, I'm, my words are escaping me, uh, the acuity of the patient. So we do things at the state based on rates, sometimes enter into very specific contracts. And what is the issue, what is the barrier between those folks ready to leave the RHCs and reside in the community? I'm not certain what that is. And the other question I had was in the difficult to discharge hospital patients, we made a very concerted effort in this supplemental budget to try and address some of those barriers. And again, it was rates. What rates do we need to provide, to give to providers in order for them to accept the responsibility of very acute uh, you know, needs patients? And part of the problem with rates is it's a little bit of a shot in the dark. You raise the rates and then over the period of trying to get people into appropriate care settings, there are no providers willing to do it for that rate. So then you come back and you increase the rate. Or, and so I'm, we're, we're, we're sensitive to that, but we are, it's a little bit of a shot in the dark on landing on the sweet spot of being able to give providers what they need in order to provide care. And I will leave it at that, uh, knowing that there are a lot of questions uh, that your uh, panelists have. Thank you, Representative Ornsby. Uh, that was great. I, um, on your question, I, um, I do know that we have reduced the number of people leaving hospitals because we've been able to address some of the needs that providers in the community need. Rates are a component part of it, for sure. Uh, housing is another piece of it. And um, providers generally, uh, community-based providers, aren't able to provide housing. So they they're reliant on the housing market to go find a place for people to live. Uh, so that is sometimes a barrier. Uh, we don't have enough specialized housing. We don't have enough housing that's dedicated for people with developmental disabilities. Um, and so that's one piece in addition to rates. Uh, some of it would be around specialization, so making sure that people understand behavioral support, um, that we have uh, crisis intervention in the community. So even when a provider is good at what they do and things are humming along. Some, some individuals will continue to occasionally go into crisis and that crisis support in the community is really critical um, as part of it. So um, all those pieces come together, as, as you mentioned. Um, you know, generally the, the rate system is, is poor. We haven't spent a lot of time investing in the community. Um, and looking at models that may work in other states, looking at models that may work for very specialized um, individuals who have predictable sorts of challenges living in the community. Uh, we kind of just throw money at the problem every once in a while, instead of looking carefully at what, what would it take? So I know there are, there is a group that's talking about this, a couple of groups that are looking at what that would be. And we're happy to meet with you more around that particular issue. Thank you. And Representative Warmsby, this is Diana again. Uh, Hi, Diana. The, first, the first part of your questions um, had to do with the 47 people who are ready to leave. That, those people are part of the Roads to Community Living Grant, which gets a 75% match from the federal government. And so- How, how much of a match, Diana? I'm sorry. 75%. We Thank only you. have 25. Thank you. So, um, those people have qualified for that program and all the steps for them to be able to move out have happened and they're just sitting waiting because there is no community placement for them to go to. Maybe we can talk sometime about those barriers, why, why there isn't, but uh, we can do that at another time. Yes. We'd love to do that. Uh, and Representative Orthby, I have a question here from Devaney Audit. Devaney, I don't know if you're still on. Um, if you are, 
please raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted. Uh, Devani um, says she has a son with um, autism spectrum disorder. She's never applied for DDA because of how difficult it is to receive services. So I want to highlight that entry to our services, there's a bouncer at the door. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. I, she doesn't work outside the home because life revolves around teaching and advocating for more equitable services, um, especially in regard to special education services. So right now, a lot of our families are impacted greatly by the school closures. Um, so students with disabilities generally have a difficult time with this format, as you can imagine, for instruction. Um, and so they're, they're also a little disproportionately impacted by the way we're delivering service in schools or not delivering it. All those these cuts may not affect us specifically. Uh, Devani would like to know how you might plan on making sure who, who so desperately need the services that you mentioned will still be able to receive them. And Devani is unmuted right now. I am. Thank you so much for taking my question. <laughs> Demi, do you have anything to add from what I read out loud? Um, just that we have met with you, um, Mr. Ormsby, multiple times. I think the first time um, my son met with you um, himself about special education services or the lack thereof <laughs> um, in some of the programs in Spokane specifically. And then we came to Olympia this legislative, this last legislative session to speak with you. We ended up speaking with your aide. I think you were on the floor. So um, my son is, he's 13 uh, and he's really passionate about becoming a self advocate because he realizes some of the deficits um, just for people with disabilities and um, like I said, I, we have never um, uh, applied for DDA ourselves. We would probably qualify. We are, you know, we, we receive free and reduced lunch, you know, so income is definitely not um, something that would limit us. However, it's so hard to apply anyways. And for families who are kind of always in that crisis mode of making sure that our children or our family members are receiving um, what they need in their day-to-day -day life. Another process is sometimes just so difficult. So I have not worked since he was born. Um, our entire life revolves around his care. And so sometimes when I see these things in an already um, underfunded system, and maybe not even underfunded, but the, the way it's allocated and, and some of the, the legislation around that, it, it's really frustrating and sobering to see how it will affect those who are already so inequitably serviced within our state. So I would like to, to know as my legislator, like some of your thoughts around that and what you are committed to doing to help those in your district that need it the most. Thanks, Devani. So I'd like to just going back to that uh, map of the services the, the the complications and you can't just pull on one string in terms of services uh you know even though the uh uh dental you know that was brought up earlier is not specific to uh dda it certainly impacts so for so many of the services that we need is not is all across the spectrum in healthcare, in behavioral health services, in substance abuse, in uh, things that would be outside of what we would normally think would be the vehicle to provide services. These gears all work together and you can't just take the teeth out of one gear and expect the machinery to operate effectively. We have to go back to our basic values. So the, the science is the science. The arithmetic is the arithmetic. The shortfall is the shortfall. That is what we're gonna have to live with and we're going to have to live within the constraints that that provides us. We have to go to our values and the values of providing for uh, the folks that are challenged to be successful and for any number of reasons. The saying and my household growing up is that the measure of an affluent society is how well we take the care of those that are disadvantaged. We go to our values and that informs the science, that informs the arithmetic, that informs our decisions. 
So in terms of specific programs, which you've done a very good job of laying out all these things and how they're interactive and how they work together, we've got to approach the solution with this, that same map, that same mechanism, all those gears and how they work together in the same way. We're none of us going to be untouched by the devastation of weather, uh, of this economic upheaval. I want to make a pitch right now that because of the challenges that the state has to solve these problems by ourselves, we have to have federal government support. And I am extremely disappointed in what I am seeing as inaction at the federal level to address real problems in communities. The state of Washington can't make up our shortfall by printing money or snapping our fingers, you know, uh, going to our cache of pixie dust we have to be able to get our federal partners on board to realize the direness of our situation and at least help us get through the short term so that we can set up uh, plans for addressing this over the long term. I know that is not a great answer to your question. I am in, we are, even with the best information that's available, very much blind to what we can expect to happen in the future because so much of it is based on human behavior that we can't predict how that's gonna go. Thank you, Representative Ormsby. And I just wanna note we're all, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, I had, you know, wanna give uh, Senator Rivers a chance to potentially ask a question and then I think we'll move on to our advocacy tips and wrap things up so that people can take their own action. Um, so I, I have somebody, Teresa McKeon, I don't know if you're still on. If you are, just raise your hand. But just another question. I, I care for my daughter who lives with severe autism at home. Um, after she left the school system, I lost over a third of my income staying home to care for her. Uh, her respite hours were only 12 hours a week. Uh, so she could only run errands and shop for food during that limited time. Um, and this just raises an, another question. Um, you know, our, our school system is a, is critical for families and for individuals to increase their independence. Um, but then when they leave school, we have families referred to as the cliff <laughs> and their parents um, really, they, they often have to quit their jobs to stay home and care for their individual. We don't have sufficient um, supported employment and day programs for individuals with developmental disabilities and, and respite hours are critical. And that is definitely one of the home and community-based services that um, will be affected very significantly. Um, I'm just wondering, Senator Rivers, if you've got thoughts about, you know, what do we do in this situation? Yeah, again, um, I think unless you have been responsible for a person with disabilities, it's really difficult to know what that respite means. It's not just being able to perform functions that mean that you can get along in daily life. It's actually about your mental health too. And I know this from uh, being responsible for my friend who uh, had Down syndrome. So I, um, I think that the role that you are all playing in talking with your legislators is very, very important asking them to reprioritize. You know, um, uh, Governor Gregoire was, I think, probably my favorite govern governor that I ever met um, because she was very courageous and she made very, very difficult decisions. And um, with all respect to Representative Ormsby, he's got a huge job, no two ways about it. Um, but it sort of tar starts at the top for us. If our governor won't declare an economic emergency and put the skids on some of the spending um, that could actually wipe out the entire deficit, then, um, then I think that, that we're all a little bit hamstrung. So I think to pump up our governor and ask him to make the hard decision, but the right and important decision, uh, the same as Governor Gregoire did, then, um, then we, uh, you know, that would go a long way to helping to solve the problem. But again, it's the personal stories and the personal experiences about, about what it's like to be you. 
and sharing that with your sharing that with your legislators, sharing that with the governor. And you know, you never know, regardless of the party, you never know what's in someone's background that uh, that that might strike a chord with them. Um, maybe some of you didn't know that I had this close relationship with a developmentally disabled person, um, but but you may have an army of advocates here to say, no, this isn't the right course. We can do better. And I expect you to do better for the most vulnerable. I really appreciated what Representative Ormsby said about a, a society being judged on its ability to take care of the most vulnerable among them. Uh, so, I think that you guys are the secret sauce. You're the special ingredient. You are the ones, um, you know, I can cry from my mountaintop all day long and, uh, and will happily on your behalf. Um, but sharing your stories, what it's like to be you and educating people, I think is so very important and, and saying we don't want to be we don't want to be held hostage to new revenue. The, we have the ability to do this now. The governor needs to declare an economic emergency. He needs to make hard decisions and he needs to prioritize us. Uh, I know that in the Senate, we just moved um, to cut our Senate budget by 11%. Um, I have the legislation that will allow uh, legislators to cut their own pay increase that we uh, we just got, uh, I don't think there's going to be a special session though. Uh, I think that uh, this is going to drag out until after the elections because people don't want to make hard decisions while others are, while, while they're up for election and just super candid with that. Um, so we may be talking about a special session that probably won't happen until after all the ballots are counted, which I also think is um, something that borders on um, at least immoral when it comes to this, this um, uh, to our disabled community. Um, so I've thrown a lot at you, um, but I think the most important ingredient is you. I think you need to buck up the governor and tell him make hard decisions about spending cuts um, and uh, and keep the disabled community whole because we've worked so hard to get to this place where we have these gains, which still don't put us back where we used to be, but to backslide now when we when it would be needless. Um, it just feels like absolutely the wrong approach to take to me. Well, thank you, Senator Rivers. And that's a great segue to our ending segment here at, in our webinar about advocacy strategies. But first, I just want to note, you can't, not hear, you can't listen to this conversation and not know that the two of you are going to be more challenged in your, in your careers as legislators than ever before. And we recognize what tough jobs you have. Um, we hope that as you make these courageous decisions and difficult decisions um, over the this next legislative session, and if we have a special session, that you'll carry our stories with you and you'll um, remember some of the things that you, you may have heard here because uh, we do appreciate that both of you seem to hear that, that um, we are a population that may need some prioritization and might have to get pulled out of the a little bit. Uh, in our world, we don't feel like equal cuts are really equitable at this point. So again, we appreciate both of you. You're very powerful. You both sit on budget committees. You're both very influential and you've been incredible guests for us here today. So I just want to thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Diana, do you well, want to- Well, we're going to go and let you know what you can be doing at this point in time. And we have a number of things that are ideas here for you. Um, one of the things is the action alerts that the ARC does. And we have uh, a number of alerts that happen. And I'm going to pull up the page. I find it. Sorry about that. So when you go to our website, 
you, if you click on the advocacy tab and go to Action Center, you're gonna find the spotlighted things. The first thing is our action alert here. And with this, you can click on that and it will give you some information about what the alert is about having to do with the budget cuts and then give you some sample um, information that you can modify to put your own story into it and then it automatically sends it to your legislators for you. And we also have a petition going. Over 1,700 people have already signed this petition to the governor and we will be sharing this with all these signatures so that he knows how important it is not to make these cuts, how many people are depending upon that. There's also a federal action alert that you can respond to. So I encourage you to check out the petition and the action alert and the other things that you will find on this page on our website. And then in addition to that, we have the Developmental Disabilities Council has developed a toolkit. Um, if you click on the link for the toolkit, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's got uh, a couple of movies that uh, people have made, short vignettes about their story and how they would be impacted by the cuts. Um, in addition, there are um, a number of strategies for social media on there, so check that out. Um, if you're new to advocacy and you're on this, this webinar, Please know that you're a good company. Uh, everybody at some point learns who their legislators are and one of the best ways to do that is to click on this link and type in your address and it will tell you your two state representatives and your senator. Um, they're people just like you and they do want to hear from you. So even if you did that today and you just wrote a quick email and said, I'm in your district, I care about issues around people with developmental disabilities or other things that you care about, I'd like to hear from you. They'll appreciate that. Um, so don't be afraid. Uh, emailing your legislator is very easy. It's their first and la dot last name at leg.wa.gov. Um, make sure you spell their name correctly. So when you go to the website, you can look up their name and make sure that's in there. Diana, you can, I'll leave you for the rest. So social media, most legislators are all on Facebook, Twitter, so um, find your legislators and make friends with them on social media. And lots of times I see that they'll post a question and ask people to respond so that they know what their constituents and what the public think about different topics and situations. And then there are lots of advocacy groups we have out there. Um, Self-advocates and leadership is the uh, self-advocate group that works around legislative issues. Um, People First of Washington is another one that also works on those issues. Uh, almost every county has a parent coalition where parents can um, get information from. They often have meetings, um, many of them now virtual <laughs> due to COVID, but it's a way to, to get together with other parents and um, brainstorm ideas or figure out how somebody else dealt with an issue you're trying to deal with. Um, and so we really encourage you to get active in some way, whether it's the petition or an action alert, sending an email, um, even looking up your legislative district so you know exactly which one you live in. And so we have one more poll for you. And this, uh, Got to go to the second poll here. So this asks, what are you going to commit to doing this month? And so let's see what the response is going to be. What do you feel like you can do um, to advocate about these budget cuts and take some action? So let's go ahead and start this poll. Diana, yes. excuse me. This is Tim Ormsby, and I, I, I'm 10 minutes late for the thing I'm supposed to be at, so I'm going <laughs> to have to beg off, but uh, going to the science and the art part of this, I wanna thank your, the, the advocates that presented, Risa, you know, from Spokane, Amy on behalf of, of Annie and Debbie, Timothy, John and Alex, uh, because of the challenge, you know, the, these are 
very, uh, I, I just appreciate the courage that it took. And I, I just one thing that Amy said about Annie, this is something that we can all maybe uh, subscribe to, loving, joyful, and kind. Those would be good things that we can do as we approach this keeping those things in mind uh, on behalf of the folks that are naturally that way and not be such curmudgeons as we face these challenges uh, that, that are coming our way. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. And that was a very good thought to leave on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We're grateful. Thank you. So people are still filling out the poll, deciding what kind of issues they want to work on this month. Well, it looks it like does look like it's slowed down. So let's see where we're at. Signing the petition was the biggest one. And that's probably a very easy thing to do. When you go there, all you have to do is put in your name and your email address. And I see that people are email, calling or emailing their legislator too. It's a good way to get your voice heard. All of these are good examples of ways that you can get involved. And I encourage you, don't just do it for one month this month, maybe do it this week and then next week do another one and just keep getting your voice out there. So your legislators know how you feel about cutting services for people with developmental disabilities. Um, each of you in your email that uh, came on to the Zoom call, you'll get a, an evaluation form tomorrow in your email. And we'd really appreciate it if you could take just a couple minutes and fill that out for us so we can see how we did. This was our first one and we're excited about it. We made it through it, yay. And so we hope that you'll help us to continue to improve on these every week and that you'll come back and join us. So thank you everybody for taking the time to come. Diana, I just wanna say thank you again too for your putting this together so eloquently. Um, we had over 90 participants today at its peak um, and we're still hanging in there late with over, almost 50 people um, and the panelists. So thank you again for everybody spending your time here. We will have five more of these and uh, they'll be with different legislators in different districts. We hope that you'll continue to attend and drop in. We do have about 30 questions here in the chat box that um, we will be sharing with the legislators and we will be collecting and keeping so that we can use those stories and questions as we continue our advocacy. So have a great long 4th of July weekend, we hope everybody and take care.